We're turning today to the 19th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, If you don't have a Bible, our ushers have some available, so uh, if you would like one just to follow along with, uh, raise your hand, they'll get one to you. But we're turning to Luke 19, and I'm beginning the reading today at verse 37, Luke 19, verse 37. This is the word of God. When Jesus came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you, and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Let's pray together. Lord, as one of your servants said that it's not more information we need. What's needed is something else, and that's true today. We don't need more information. We don't need a few more facts. What we need is you. And we would ask that during this time we share together that you're going to make that crystal clear to us and that you're going to draw us into your embrace because we will know that if indeed our lives are going to be at rest, if they're going to have meaning, If they're going to amount to anything and really stand for something, if we're going to experience peace, it will only be because of our relationship with you. We would ask you to make that crystal clear to us, and then, oh God, by your grace, your empowering presence, help us to respond with all our heart. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. In the year 146 B.C., After roughly 150 years of continuing conflict, Rome besieged the city of Carthage and finally conquered it. That was in the Third Punic War. As a result, the city of Carthage fell. It was totally destroyed by the Romans. And the Carthaginians, those who weren't sold into slavery, were slaughtered right down to the smallest babe in arms. An end, really to the Carthaginian race. After the conquering of the city, as uh, the soldiers were running through, the Roman soldiers are looting and they're pillaging and uh, destroying, uh, the Roman general, Scipio Africanus, uh, was riding through the city. And as he did so, he broke into tears. He began to cry uncontrollably. There are some historians that say the reason why that is is because even though he was a Roman general, a military man, Scipio Africanus was really a man of deep sensitivity. He was a very passionate man, a very compassionate man, uh, and he was moved by what he saw. But one of the people who was with him was the Greek historian Polybius. And Polybius was nearby when somebody, uh, one of his soldiers, went up to the general and asked him if he was okay and what was wrong. And according to Polybius, General Scipio said, I'm crying because every empire comes to an end. And I see the day in the future when what happened here at Carthage is going to happen to Rome. And indeed it did. 550 years later, the Visigoths did the same thing to Rome that the Romans had done to Carthage. And while they didn't wipe the Romans out to a man, they uh, certainly ravaged the city just as Carthage had been ravaged. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem is really, it is this great moment of celebration. That, has been, that was true on that day. It continues to be true for us, particularly within the Christian faith, uh, all of our years. I mean, I've grown up in the church, for the most part, 
uh, Palm Sunday is always this big day of celebration. And I don't think we waved palm fronds when I was a kid or even a high schooler. Uh, but still, it was a big day. There were wonderful hymns and there's wonderful music. And it was a big, joyous time. Uh, and that is true for us today. We've had parades, which we don't normally have, and we're waving palm fronds. And it's, just, it's a great carry-on of that tradition of what happened on that particular day. It, it was, everybody's yelling, they're, they're shouting, they're singing, they're putting coats on the ground for the donkey to walk on, they're waving palm branches. And it's so raucous that actually some of the deeply devout are getting a little scared. They're becoming a little nervous. And they come to Jesus and they said, Would you, you know, you really, we need to tone this down because all this shouting about a king, it can get the nervous. The, the, the Romans may get a little excited. They may become unhappy. And when Rome's unhappy, ain't nobody happy. Uh, so let's take it down a level, shall we? And Jesus, however, does not respond to that admonition. He, rather, he says, he validates everything that's going on. He says, this is a moment of joy. If they're not shouting, the rocks are going to start shouting. Quite possibly, because Jesus is familiar with that uh, prophecy from the Old Testament. Uh, shout aloud, daughter of Zion. Shout for joy, daughter of Jerusalem. Your king is coming to you humble and riding on a donkey, on the colt of a donkey. Jesus knows that, and he's valid. He says, this is right. All of this celebrating is right. And then the most interesting thing happens. So he's coming down the Mount of Olives, and there's Jerusalem spread out before him. Jesus wept. That's past tense. Uh, present tense of that word is weep. Weep. Weep is a great word that rhymes with other words. It rhymes with peep. You know what a peep is? Little yellow marshmallow chicken, right? They're all over the place nowadays. I see them so much, I'm seeing them in my sleep. They're peeps. Uh, it's a little thing. Weep rhymes with beep, like a horn. Now, a diesel truck horn honks. A bicycle horn beeps. It's a little horn. Weep rhymes with little marshmallow chickens, little horns. Weep sounds like a small word, but there's nothing small about it. The pure definition, the denotation of weep is to make loud lamentation. It is a passionate outpouring of grief it's like the racking sobs of somebody who has just tragically lost a loved one to death. So let's read it as it would be. As Jesus coming down off the Mount of Olives, there is a city, and he bawls his eyes out. Everyone else cheering, singing, yelling, and yet Jesus is engaging in this triumphal lament. This morning we want to look at why he was crying and also what it means to follow him as one's king. When God chose the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to be his very particular people, he gave them a task, and it's a very specific task, Going all the way back to the days of Abraham, it was going to be their job or their calling, if you will, to live and speak on God's behalf. It was their job now to lead the rest of the world, the, the nations or the Gentiles, as they're often called, to lead everybody else to God, to bring them into a relationship with God. They were to do that so that others then too would experience God's peace, God's shalom. But instead of being turned outward in that great enterprise, what so often happened was the Jews kept turning inward. They, kept, they had this preoccupation of trying to keep God to themselves, trying to keep God's blessings to themselves, trying to keep God's peace to themselves. And so instead of having this attitude of the world that we're, we're for you, they, they instead develop this kind of an adversarial relationship to the rest of the world, not for the world, but more often than not against it. 
In the 15th chapter of Luke, Jesus tells three parables in in succession, one right after the other. There's the uh, parable of the lost sheep, there's parable of the lost coin, there's parable of a lost son. And in those parables, there's a phrase that Jesus keeps repeating over and over. Now, in the time that Jesus walked this earth, there was a very popular Jewish proverb. It went like this. There will be joy in heaven over one sinner who is obliterated before God. It was like people were looking forward to the destruction of those who were living in ways that displeased God or in ways that were not right. It was almost like they anticipated that with great relish or, or with some form of uh, satisfaction. Looking forward not to the salvation of people, but to the, to the punishment of them. And, but in these parables from Luke, Jesus says the exact opposite of that. There will be joy in heaven over one sinner who repents, who comes to God. Jesus said the opposite of what the devout people were saying. And that's something he kept saying, he said it different ways, but he kept saying it throughout his entire ministry. Luke chapter 9, the Son of Man did not come to destroy people's lives, but to save them. John 3, for God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. John 10, all the so-called messiahs who came before me were thieves and robbers. A thief comes only to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. The task of the church, task of you and me, of Christians, is no different than it was for ancient Israel. Our task being to bring people in, to bring them into a relationship with Christ, to bring them into the kingdom uh, so they become citizens of that, to bring them into that experience of the abundant life that Jesus came to afford them, to bring them that experience of God's peace. We are to be, and it's said in a lot of different ways. Jesus said you're to be a city on a hill welcoming the weary traveler to rest. You're to be a light that shines brightly so people don't have to grope around in the dark. Paul said that we are to be God's agents of reconciliation. That's our task, that's our job. But so often we're hamstrung in that. Hamstringing, uh, I've heard that word all my life, but I looked it up this week for the very first time. You've got a tendon in your thigh, the back of the thigh, it's called a hamstring tendon. Uh, there was a time, fortunately long removed from us, it was way back, when um, people would intentionally cut that tendon, either in an animal or in a human being. And the reason they did that was to restrict uh, either the animal or the person's movement. Uh, if it's an animal, it's so they wouldn't go wandering around and you could slaughter them all the sooner. Uh, if it was a human, that was usually something done with somebody who was in slavery, but they were running away and that kind of thing, so you'd, you'd cut the hamstring tendon. Uh, which would cripple them, and they got around very laboriously, very painfully, uh, but they wouldn't be running around anymore. Uh, We still use the term, uh, not as that physical idea of crippling somebody, but it means nowadays, if you're hamstrung, you have become incapable of doing a certain thing. There's there's something that's preventing you from doing that. Uh, For an athlete, that can be an injury of some kind. For somebody in business, it can be uh, a reversal of fortune that has caused things to go into play that is really working against them now, uh, so they're hamstrung in their business. Frankly, we're hamstrung in our evangelism. And one of the problems with our task or with carrying out on the work that God has given us is that while we're supposed to represent Jesus and make his good news known to others, just like Israel, we don't always like the other people that we're supposed to bring that news to. We dislike them. We don't want to see them saved. We want to see them obliterated. We don't like them. I don't like them because of their race. We don't like them because of their lifestyle. We don't like them because of where they've come from. We don't like them because of their faith or because of their lack of faith. And if you don't like those people very much, getting them saved really doesn't become a very high priority. Let them rot and die. How do we do a credible job of reaching people if we'd rather see them obliterated than saved? 
Throughout Jesus' whole lifetime, the temple in Jerusalem was always under construction. Um, by the time he's doing his earthly ministry, he's working as Messiah, the temple at that point has already been under construction for 40 long years. Following Jesus' death and his resurrection and his ascension, it would continue to be under construction for another 30 years. It would not be finished until 63 AD. That's one of the reasons why when Jesus said, uh, you destroy this temple, I'll raise it up in three days, and we know that he was talking about his body and not about the temple. That's one of the reasons why people scoffed at that because they thought he was talking about the temple, and they said, it's been under construction for 40 years, not done yet, and you think you're going to raise it up in, in three days. Uh, so that, that's why, for them, that was such a colossal joke. In uh, one of the adult classes, we've been studying the book of Zechariah, that prophet, Zechariah is a prophet who is living uh, at a period of time where following the Babylonian conquest of Jerusalem, they conquered the city, they laid siege to it, um, they finally conquered it, they tore it to pieces, they dismantled the temple, tore it down to the ground, uh, and then they took uh, the leading citizens, anybody who could cause problems in other words, they took them off and forced exile or slavery into Babylon and made them live there where they could keep an eye on them. Uh, some, not quite 70 years, about 58 years later, uh, a fellow comes to the throne named Cyrus. Uh, he establishes a policy, everybody go home. Uh, you can go home, in fact, you can even go home and begin, can begin to rebuild your places of worship. So some of the Jews begin to do that. They begin to go back to Judah, back to Jerusalem, and Zechariah goes with them. He goes, and another prophet by the name of Haggai goes as well. And as they get there, they're trying to get people excited. They're trying to convince people that good is coming. But Jerusalem is a wreck. It is a ghost town. It's hard living there. Um, trying to get the temple rebuilt is hard work. And there are not very many people. And it's not going very well. So Zechariah and Hagar are the ones that are saying, you know, we, we, it's going to happen. God's going to get into this. And it's going to take place. And we're going to get the temple rebuilt. And life is going to return to, to a good level. And Zechariah says that over and over again, speaking on God's behalf. I've never stopped loving you. I've got great things in store for you. The temple is going to be rebuilt. Eventually, the walls are going to be rebuilt. Jerusalem is going to be a great city again, and it's going to be teeming with life, and the land is going to be full of produce, and there are going to be old people sitting on their porches. There's going to be children playing in their streets. It's just going to be wonderful. And in chapter 6 of Zechariah, the whole chapter is given to that. God's saying, it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be good. I have great plans for you, great things in store for you. To get to the very last verse, and he said, it's all going to happen if you diligently obey the Lord your God. And the entire book of Zechariah is full of that if. That one provision. It's going to be wonderful, provided you live the way I want you to live. Keep that in mind. It's verses 41 40 through 44. Let's read them again. This is a different uh, translation I'm reading from now. As Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city spread out before him, he bawled and cried out, if only you had known what makes for peace, but you've turned a blind eye to it. And so in the days of your descendants, your enemies will surround you and build siege works against you. They will beat you and your children to the ground. They will tear down the city and the temple because you refuse to let God get close when he tried to approach you. Jesus wept, he cried his eyes out because he knew that what the Babylonians had done to Jerusalem was going to happen all over again, only this time it would be the Romans who do it. Once again, the people turning their back on God, fighting God, wanting their way, not God's way, until the point comes where they have set up this whole process, this whole way of thinking, this whole culture within their country that makes that defeat by the Romans inevitable because they did not know what made for peace. 70 AD, the Romans had had enough 
and they destroyed Jerusalem and the temple only seven years after it had been finished. So not only did the people miss out in terms of communicating God's peace to others, they didn't get to experience it themselves. And the reason why I think this is a triumphal lament on Jesus' part is because their inability certainly got excited about him being a king. The point, though, was they didn't live under his kingship. They didn't obey him as their master, as their king. And so, though they didn't have him as king, that didn't prevent him from being king. He was still king. They just didn't get to benefit from his reign. If you had only known what would bring you peace, Jesus cried. The people thought they knew what would bring him peace. They thought, you know, if we could just, if we just get the Romans out of the country, if they would just go away, if we could kill them all, that would bring us peace. If we could just get everybody to obey the minutia of the law, that would finally make for peace. If we could only be, we Pharisees, if we could be in charge, that would bring peace. Or we Sadducees, if we could be in charge, we'd bring peace. If we Zealots were running things, that would bring us peace. If, if we Jews ruled the world, that would bring us peace. And what is it that you think is going to bring you peace today? If only it would rain, we would have peace. If only the Republicans controlled the White House and the legislature, then we would have peace. Or Democrats, you can play it either way. If only I had more money, I'd have peace. If only my health was better, I would finally have peace. If only foreigners would stop moving into this country, we would have peace. If, if only... But none of that makes for peace. About 10 years ago, I was in my former pastorate, and we were exploring as a church, uh, entering into a partnership with a, an Ethiopian congregation down in Las Vegas. And so um, I uh, made arrangements and invited to worship with that congregation. So one Sunday, um, I left Bishop at about 6.30 in the morning, drove to Las Vegas, because their worship service started at 12 noon. Uh, and I got there just in time for worship, and I thought, well, okay, this be okay, and I'm, you know, I'll worship, and then at one o'clock or so, I'll go out for lunch. Not realizing, Ethiopian worship is three and a half hours, um, and, uh, and it was long. And when you don't speak Oromo, which was the language going on, it gets even longer. Um, so it's long, three hours. And then at uh, about four o'clock, uh, the elder who had invited me down said, let's go to lunch. Uh, so we did ended up this restaurant. And as we're talking, I, I shared with him, I said, you know, I really don't know anything about Ethiopian history. Uh, I know that way back when I was in college and I, prior to that, uh, it was uh, governed by an emperor, a fellow by named Haile Selassie, who was the uh, emperor of uh, Ethiopia. I said, that's, that's all I know. And so this fellow then uh, began to talk to me about uh, Ethiopian history. Uh, went all the way back to the time when the Italians uh, tried to colonize and you know, were attacking the country and then on through the 50s, 60s. And he said, after Haile Selassie was uh, deposed, he said the communists came to power, uh, which was a really hard and terrible time. And I found that out just three years ago when I went to the Ethiopia myself. Uh, and even uh, some of the Shokacho people we talked to talked about how horrible that time had been. Um, and tens of thousands of Ethiopians of all kinds and all different faiths were uh, being killed. Uh, but as I was talking with this elder from the church down in Las Vegas, um, and he said the, the, the communists came to power. Now I'm a good red, white, and blue American. Uh, you know, I remember the Red Scare, I remember the Cold War, and I said, oh my gosh, that's so terrible that the communists were in charge. And the fellow who had already talked about how hard that time was, dismissively waved his fork in the air and said to me, as if he didn't know what planet I was from, it doesn't make any difference who's in power. We always belong to Jesus. 
hard as that time was, there was a peace those Ethiopian Christians knew that really is so absent from our experience. I would hope, it would be my prayer, that you and I know that kind of peace, which doesn't come from your circumstances. That only comes from Jesus and that relationship with him. I pray we'd know that peace, that we would have that peace. And even more, I would pray that we'll be good at communicating that peace to others. Let's pray together. Lord, you've called us into your kingdom, and yet so many times we're, we're living in a different world. We're living somewhere else. We're living in a place where our agendas trump yours. We're living in a place where what we want is the most important thing. We lose total sight of what you want. We live by our own wits. We live by our own appetites. And what you've clearly indicated to us is what gets left behind. We don't want to be that kind of people anymore because that kind of life doesn't give us peace. It robs us of peace. So would you come into each and every one of us here? Would you show us in the teachings of Jesus what and who we're supposed to be, what we're supposed to be about, and then, oh God, by your grace, give us the ability to live into that calling, to be your agents of shalom in this world. And as we do that, may Jesus be honored. We ask that in his name. Amen.